So uh, it's amazing, actually, looking back over the five years or so of the uh, Autism Consortium Symposia, how almost every year we seem to be um, uh, discussing, you know, it's, uh, amazing new discoveries in the area of uh, understanding the genetic causes of autism. Uh, over the years, we've heard about copy number variants, chromosome rearrangements, common variation, rare variation, uh, RNA expression, de novo point mutations. And so in the last two talks, we'll hear uh, some of the latest work being done around town on other uh, genetic causes of autism spectrum disorders. Um, and they're on each, the, the talks are both around, around genetics, but on two very different aspects of genetics, because some of the autism mutations are never inherited in families. Some are always inherited in families, and some, uh, like tuberous sclerosis, can sometimes be inherited and sometimes uh, is not inherited, it represents a spontaneous or de novo mutation. So the first talk will be by Mike Talkowski, and it'll be on uh, chromosome rearrangements. Uh, and um, those are typically not inherited, things like Down syndrome, they're typically spontaneous. And Mike did his PhD in uh, genetics and epidemiology at the University of Pittsburgh. He did his postdoctoral training here uh, at Mass General Hospital in Harvard with, uh, with Jim Gazella, and he's an instructor in neurology and an assistant in genetics at Mass General Hospital uh, and the Center for hum Human Genetics uh, Research. So Mike, I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I will uh, try to stick to the time. And I know it's the end of the day, so what I'm going to do is just kind of take you on a data whirlwind of a lot of different results that we've had. It'll be all results, very little theory, um, so you can just kind of relax and watch through it. Uh, so a lot of the work that I've been doing is kind of asking what are some of the few big questions that are left? And this was touched on earlier uh, by Steve and some other folks. And that what are we really missing in the technology that we're using? So we've done a lot of genome-wide association and exomes and low-depth whole genomes. And from those techniques, what are we missing that might be contributing to autism? The other question is how can we interpret pathogenic variation when we see it with a still very immature um, annotation of the morbid genome? So when we disrupt the gene, we really don't have a very good idea still of what the outcome of that is. And finally, in what capacity can genomics really provide a, an immediate clinical impact? So I'll begin the talk just by saying this is sort of the conventional diagnostic standard, and I think it needs to improve. So, you know, if you have an abnormal ultrasound in the prenatal period, say, and you have a balanced chromosomal abnormality, we think of looking at the chromosomes as this very neat, you know, structure. But in fact, this is what a chromosomal a cytogenetic test looks like. This is what a karyotype looks like. And what you see here is a translocation between chromosomes 6 and 8. And when this patient had an array CGH, it was completely unremarkable. So their genome was balanced and they had a translocation. <clears throat> Based on the karyotype alone, you can't tell where that translocation is apart from a very gross change in the chromosome, and it provides you almost no information on the genes disrupted or the sequences interrupted. So this family has to go home basically with a result of a genetic abnormality without any information on where that genetic abnormality occurred and what happened and what we can predict from that. And I think in this age of high throughput genomics, we can, we can do better than this. And this is what a lot of this work is going to be related to. Um, so the work that I'm going to talk about is all related to balanced chromosomal abnormalities. These are chromosomal changes without significant genomic imbalance. They include translocations, inversions, and excision insertions. They haven't really been talked about much today or, or in most meetings, actually, of genetic testing. Um, they can disrupt a single locus in an otherwise complex disorder. So as opposed to a copy number variation, say, where you disrupt many, many genes, these can disrupt one gene and lead to haploinsufficiency of a single point in the genome. And we can then use that to interpret outcome. They're not detectable by array CGH. And these are very rare or even private events that you don't see in multiple people. So they really are a unique research opportunity if we can get to them at very high resolution. So a lot of the postdoctoral work that I did was really coming up with ways to sequence chromosomal abnormalities based on an original paper by Mike Snyder's group. And we went through and came up with a series of different ways with Mark Daly and Jim Gassell and a number of other people. Uh, I won't talk about the methods at all, except to say that we have gone for everywhere from very deep whole genome sequencing to large insert jumping libraries to targeted capture. And we've used a whole array of genetic techniques to get to the exact nucleotide sequence at which these chromosomal rearrangements break in, in the DNA. So I'm going to tell you about a few of the outcomes that we've discovered from looking at chromosomal abnormalities. The first outcome is that these events are actually much, much more complex than we ever understood um, once we started to look at them under the microscope of whole genome sequencing. In fact, what we expected was somewhere around a 2.8% um, complex event outcome. 
and that was what we had known forever from cytogenetic testing. When we went and sequenced these events, we sequenced 52 different subjects with a chromosomal abnormality. We found almost 20% of these were complex. And what we found that was very unique was at the breakpoints of 90% of these complex events, you saw one or more cryptic inversions, so small inversions at the breakpoint of what we thought was just a standard chromosomal rearrangement actually existed. And we thought that pointed somewhat to mechanism. The other thing that we found was that these can be extremely complex. So in this case, we were told by karyotype that the child had a 5X chromosomal rearrangement, but we went and sequenced. What we found was actually 14 different breakpoints between chromosomes 5 and X. And the genetic machinery was able to restitch all of these breakpoints back together in a phenomenon that's now known as chromothripsis or chromosomal shattering. All of this took place in a relatively balanced manner. However, the chromosomes were completely rearranged between these two regions, and they're very localized to specific regions that have been shattered and restitched back together, both in same strand and inverted orientations. This has occurred in a number of different people, and this is kind of what the chromosomes look like at the end of the day, where you have all of these small little pieces of chromosomes that have been shattered and then recombined in a completely aberrant way. A second example of this we came across is an example where we were told there was a translocation between th chromosomes three and five. And when we sequenced the translocation, we never found a re rearrangement between three and five. Because what actually happened in this genome is chromosome seven was shattered up into a number of different pieces and inserted into the breakpoints between chromosomes three and five. So again, in this child's genome, there was thought to be a single, simple rearrangement between two chromosomes. And it turns out that there were 11 different breakpoints among three chromosomes. They were all shattered and stitched back together in a number of different aberrant ways. Now, one of the outcomes of this, of course, is that we can't see these events. So we don't know that they occur. So in fact, these were thought to be balanced because when we did array CGH and some of these copy number variant studies that you've seen, it's completely normal. However, this child had 23 and a half megabases of DNA rearranged in their genome. So about 0.7% of their genome wasn't where it started. And yet they lost only 6 KB of DNA among all those rearrangements. In the second child, there was about 6 megabases rearranged and yet less than 2 KB were actually gained or lost. So that was sort of the first outcome that we found out that these rearrangements are actually much, much more complex. But the purpose of doing these studies was really to try to get to individual genes and individual causal contributions to autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. And we thought that these really represented a powerful route to those discoveries. So we performed a study where we sequenced children with chromosomal abnormalities. They had balanced rearrangements, and these balanced rearrangements were interpreted clinically as pathogenic. There were 36 de novo events, so they weren't in the parents, and they occurred only in the child. Two were inherited from an affected parent, so they segregated with disease in the family. And all the results that I talked about before and that I'll talk about right now have been validated. They've been PCR validated and Sanger sequenced. However, and this is sort of something that I think Steve and, and some others started to get at today, is when you find a rearrangement that's disrupted in a single person, very much like exome sequencing, where we find all of these novel variants and we're not sure what they mean, we need convergent evidence. We need other pieces of data from other people to tell us that perhaps these are important genes. So what we did was we looked for convergent genomic data. We looked at mRNA expression of the genes that were disrupted. We went to a case control CNV cohort that we collected from a number of clinical diagnostic laboratories who were wonderful in donating their array CGH data. So we had almost 34,000 cases from molecular diagnostic laboratories where we looked at CNV data. And from the existing genome-wide association studies, we looked at almost 14,000 controls. And we compared these cases and controls to each other. We then went and looked at common variation data from genome-wide association studies in autism and schizophrenia. And the reason that we went to the schizophrenia is as we sequenced these children with autism and neurodevelopmental disorders, what we found was really four categories of gene disruptions. The first category were genes that were previously known to be associated with autism or neurodevelopment, including some classics like OTS2 and GRIN2B and SNTG2 and CDKL5. We also found this group of really interesting genes that were single gene contributors to what we once thought were large genomic disorder regions. So these were large segments of, region, of the chromosomes that had been deleted or duplicated previously and were diagnosed as microdeletion syndromes. But in fact, what we found is if you disrupt just one gene in the region, you can recapitulate most of the phenotype of that microdeletion syndrome. Category three was this whole category of novel genes. We had 22 novel genes that had never been described in any way in autism or neurodevelopment. Some of those genes, like CHD8, have been very exciting because they've gone on now in these recent exome sequencing studies that you've seen to be validated. In fact, a number of studies have now come out and said CHD8 was one of the better hits in autism. So this is a unique way in which a single 
child with a rearrangement actually got us to a gene that now when we look at thousands and thousands of exomes have started, has started to be validated and the picture comes together. Finally, category four was this interesting category of genes that were disrupted in children with autism. And when you went and looked at the literature, and my, my background was in schizophrenia genetics, when you look at the genome-wide association studies, what you found was this clustering of genes that had been significantly associated with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and other adult-onset psychiatric disorders by common variation studies. So I, I just a note on sort of how powerful these single gene contributors to the microdeletion syndromes were. We isolated one gene, MBD5, through a study of almost 100,000 people, where we found that MBD5 was in fact a necessary and sufficient causal locus in 2Q23.1 microdeletion syndrome. So anybody who had disruption of only MBD5 had the same phenotype in about 90% of the, the clinical features that we looked at as children who were previously diagnosed with a microdeletion syndrome. Um, some work that we did with Nico Katsanis narrowed down the 16P region, a specific neuroanatomical phenotype in zebrafish, to a single gene, where he knocked down every gene in the 16P11.2 region and came out with KCTD13 as a, as a gene that was responsible for a, a, a microcephaly and macrocephaly head phenotype in zebrafish. And now we're going on and doing a series of RNA-seq experiments where we're really interested in what leads to these variable outcomes in 16P11.2, and Ian Blumenthal has a poster on that um, that might still be up. So the overview of these studies, and really this is kind of the, the, the overall point, is we take a child who has a chromosome rearrangement, and we came up with all these genes that were disrupted in neurodevelopment or from psychiatric disorders or from genomic disorders, and then we went and looked at gene expression and CNVs and genome-wide association studies, and I'm sort of an agnostic geneticist. I, I don't subscribe to this idea that it has to be rare variation or it has to be common variation or it has to be CNVs. I think, in fact, there's probably a pathogenic role for all of these variants, and this is what our data is starting to show, that in fact, when we took a subset of the gene, when we took all of the genes as a gene set that were disrupted by chromosomal rearrangements and looked at the, geno the schizophrenia and autism genome-wide association data, we found a burden of common variant association signals in those 34 genes. And in fact, we found any subset of 13 genes had a significant association in that group. So this shows that whether you're looking at common variation or whether you're looking at very rare, highly penetrant mutations, these events can all contribute to autism. So the, the outcome is really that um, non-recurrent, rare, or even uh, completely private events can point us towards genes of interest in neurodevelopmental disorders if we allow ourselves to look at all of the genetic information that's available, not just a single subset of it. So the point of my talk, actually, now we'll get to in the last three or four minutes, was what we're actually doing with this data and what, how we're adapting these methods to a clinical tool for rapid prenatal sequencing. And this is not necessarily um, specific to prenatal sequencing, but that's the uh, arena that we used it in the first time. So we had this case study, and the uh, mother was actually pregnant, and an, am er, an ultrasound revealed a heart defect, and later on a number of other defects. Um, along the way of the pregnancy. At 33 weeks, there was um, polyhydramnios, and they had an amnio reduction, and we were asked to come in and look at the um, fetal DNA from amniocentesis. So we took the amniocytes, and we developed a clinical sequencing test. Now, this was a proof of principle experiment, so we didn't do it in, in a clinically actionable timeline, and we didn't do it early in the pregnancy. This was just sort of a retrospective study to see if we could do it. And what we did was this was the, I'm sorry, this was the cytogenetic result that I showed you at the very beginning. The child had a chromosome translocation of chromosomes six and eight and a completely normal array CGH, and that was the, all the information that we had. So based on these events, what you would normally get is a 6.4% um, risk of an untoward outcome because we know nothing about the sequence that's disrupted. So our group developed a 13-day sequencing and analysis pipeline where we actually took the DNA and put it through our jumping library protocol where we have large inserts. We sequenced the DNA at Paradigm 25. We aligned all the reads. We came up with a predictive outcome of exactly where that translocation was. And then we validated that by Sanger sequencing all within a two-week timeline, a theoretical two-week timeline of um, the pipeline. What we found, unfortunately, was that the chromosomal translocation actually disrupted a locus, CHD7. CHD7 is actually known to be a pathogenic locus in CHARGE syndrome, which is a very severe neurodevelopmental disorder. That lead, led to a predictive outcome of CHARGE syndrome in the child. And in fact, um, at birth, the, the child was carried to term, and at birth, the child was actually diagnosed with CHARGE syndrome based on the clinical features alone um, without our data. So this shows that within about a two-week timeline, during prenatal gestation, we were able to come up with a completely predictive diagnosis of CHARGE syndrome that is actually quite penetrant. Um, CHD8 
CHD7 mutations actually account for 90% of a narrow diagnosis of CHARGE syndrome, although there's been very little data on balance rearrangements disrupting CHARGE uh, CHD7. Unfortunately, in this case, it was quite a severe case, and the child did pass away at 10 days of age. So that was sort of our idea of a retrospective, can we do this study, since we've actually implemented this twice in real time. Um, in the first case, we had an inversion karyotype that was given to us, and we sequenced it and took that inversion down to the, an individual base pair, and we found disruption of a gene, KHDRBS3, which is actually an RNA binding protein that regulates alternative splicing. It seems like an important gene, something you probably should have two copies of, and yet there was no evidence in the literature or OMIM or any of the databases or convergent data we had to suggest that there was any phenotypic outcome from disrupting this gene. The second child um, had a translocation, and we disrupted a gene RFC3, which is actually a replication factor, and its accessory protein in DNA replication. Again, an important gene, something that it seems like you should have two copies of, but we could find no evidence in the literature or in any of our convergent genomic data, including genome-wide association in our CNVs, that this would lead to a pathogenic outcome, or at least a predictive early onset outcome. So really, without any compelling evidence, we interpreted these as variants of unknown significance. One of the families, the first one, actually chose to have this information returned to them, and they used this information, and based on our outcome, they actually decided to keep the child, and the child was carried to term, and um, I very recently found out it was born, and, and everything looks normal so far, and the baby's happy and healthy and home with their family. So, of course, they have a long lifetime of worrying about what exactly this rearrangement did, but based on the interpretation, it looks like that the child, to this moment, is actually clinically normal. So, just some provocative questions for the crowd is sort of, you know, do we want to do this? Can we do this clinically? Well, the answer is yes. And I mean, I think there's very little question that whole genome sequencing is coming in clinical diagnostics. And the question is just how are we going to implement it and how are we going to interpret it? How do we deal with the ambiguities? How do we educate clinicians and counselors and families when, as you've seen the geneticists talk today, we don't really understand a lot of what happens when we change the genome, when we change the chromatin, when we change the organization of the chromosomes in the nucleus. But really, I think at the end of the day, this illustrates the power of sequencing and the complications that can come up from that power due to our really quite immature annotation still of the morbid genome, our immature understanding of what happens when we disrupt the gene. One key point, and this is the last point I'll make, is that at present, medical decisions are already made based simply on the karyotype. So if there's any concern about understanding the, the sequence of a genome in the prenatal period, well, families are already making medical decisions, and they're making them based on just those gross changes in the chromosomes that I showed you that have actually no information onto what sequence is disrupted. So that's why I think we can do better. So in conclusion, I'll just say that chromosomal aberrations can really offer insight into pathogenic loci and uh, disease mechanisms of genome reorganization. And I would cautiously say that large insert sequencing can really provide an immediate diagnostic refl reflex text to conventional cytogenetic testing available now and in the clinic. And as we've shown, we've already done it a number of times. So these are all the people in my lab and in a large collection of folks around Boston and elsewhere that have contributed. Uh, the folks in bold have really put a lot of effort into all of the studies involved. Thank you.